Hey, it's great to be here and great to finally meet Iowa's new offensive coordinator and get to kind of pick his brain a little bit today. Well, before I pick your brain with a lot of buzz terms and words that he dropped, uh, we'll just get your initial impressions, Tom. Um, I was impressed with, with Tim and what he said. I, I think he said some things that are going to be receptive to Iowa fans who, you know, were a little less warm to him maybe uh, initially. I think he... He was um, open to change, open to um, making some alterations to the to the offense. Um, loves tight ends. I think that's music to Kirk Ferentz's ears and probably to a lot of Iowa fans' ears. Um, he's going to run some RPO. Uh, he's going to do some different things. It's not all going to be like the old Iowa offense. So I, I think from that perspective – it sounds okay. Now the proof will be in the pudding and what they, they put out there. You know, I asked him about your starting quarterback is probably not going to be available this spring. What challenges does that present? And he talked about that and, uh, but he doesn't seem to think it's going to be um, a hurdle they can't overcome because Cade McNamara has plenty of experience. So um yeah, overall positive. Uh, Corey was there as well. He can he can speak to this as well. Yeah, Folks, I, got I think you recognize this guy. Yeah, Corey Bratta from the Hawkeye of the Storm was there as well. Corey I just walked in my door, so I got about a about four and a half hours of driving for me round trip today. But it was worth it. I wanted to to be there, and uh, I was really impressed with Tim. And, and I'll uh, I'll gladly pivot off of my initial reaction that I had on the Sunday when this news came down, I was very skeptical. And some of that's, I talked about it based upon comparing the power five backgrounds of both Johns and Lester, but I was really impressed with Tim today. And part of that is just his knowledge as a quarterback. I think Tom kind of brought that up. Just his knowledge of the passing game is going to be so valuable. And um, Kirk was asked about the RPO. And I think it's fair to say that that's going to be a part of the Iowa plan. I don't know how much how much that's going to be integrated, exactly what it's going to look like. I, one thing that stood out to me, Tom, I'm curious if you caught this as well. Um, I believe it was Tim that actually brought this up, but uh, what he felt like he gained from a year at Green Bay. And I think Kirk mentioned it as well, but that just seemed to be, I mean, obviously Kirk downplayed what happened at Syracuse a long time ago. But what we saw at Mich Western Michigan and then being able to, to be a part of the uh, Matt LaFleur um, staff there mm -hmm. at uh, Green Bay for a year, um, I, I assume that he learned a lot from that experience. And he brought up Elmhurst because that was a Shanahan system as well. So he's he does have a lot. Of, I mean, he, he coached his style of football, but there's some intricacies there, right, Tom? Yeah, and I, I think diving into this last year for him is, is really worthwhile because – um, I, I know some people were trying, some people who were, uh, let's just say skeptical of the hire were using it and saying, oh, well, he was a defensive analyst. No, he was, he was an an analyzing the offenses of their opponents and presenting it to the Green Bay defense. Um, and it was even more than that, uh, from what I've been told, uh, just studying some of those. And, and so he's studying you know, the San Francisco offense, Kyle Shanahan, what they run. Uh, studying Detroit with Ben Johnson, one of the better offensive mind, young offensive minds that that, um, that you'll find. Uh, every one of the teams that Green Bay played this year, he was basically diving into that world and studying that offense and, and presenting that to the defensive staff and to the defensive players for Green Bay. So you have to learn a lot in that time. And you're probably picking some things up. You're like, boy, this is really good. Um, and, and he kind of hinted at that, but it was emphasized to me um, uh, later today from some people that they're like, yeah, there's, this is a lot that was going on here. And this is going to be helpful because that's, that's, um, that's where you learn, you, you know, you don't know everything, but you can watch what other teams are doing and 
and you know there's <laughs> that's one of the great secrets of football and 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 really any sport i mean you know you've got basketball how many people borrow uh, brad stevens's inbound plays because he's so good at his inbounds plays it's the same thing in football you see something you're like boy i'm gonna run that and see if i can make it work and he's got a lot of different route concepts i thought that was interesting uh, when he talked about the different route concepts i thought it was interesting that he's going to be upstairs and he talked he talked a lot about how important that is and how you get a better view of things and i think that's great i really do that's the most that's maybe the most important thing i took from today maybe that's me being short-sighted but the fact that he went out and said in-game adjustments are so important and they're so hard to make when you're calling plays or trying to, to see things from the sidelines and that has been a criticism that I know Don Patterson has had and uh, about the situation with Brian ever since his press box meltdown in 2017, he ended up moving downstairs. And it is, I, I can't imagine, especially a guy who didn't have play calling experience, that did not help Brian. Now, that was his choice, I guess, to, to be down on the sidelines. But I, I think that's wonderful to hear that. I, I think fans should be encouraged that their play caller is going to be upstairs. Yeah, I do, too. I think that was that was. um you know, important an important thing to learn from him was what he well, how he's going to do that um, because I think you know there's value being downstairs and he talked about that when he was you know as a head coach he just had to be down there and call plays but you see so much upstairs you just do you've got a full view of the field you can see what they're doing from an adjustment standpoint uh, defensively. Um, and understand what's going on. And as long as you're able to communicate and you've got people down on the sidelines that can communicate what you want done to your players, you shouldn't have any problem. And, you know, he should have that very easily with, you know, the offensive line coach, running backs coach, tight ends, uh, and the yet to be named wide receiver coach. And Tom, you brought up wide receiver play. Um, he was asked about, you know, getting the, the ball into the, the hands of his playmakers. One thing I appreciate, and this is a quote from him. He said that we're going to be disciplined and aggressive. Uh -huh. And um, I know that's probably like, well, that's obvious. Any play caller wants to be disciplined. Any play caller wants to be aggressive. But the aggression, I think, is really going to tickle the ears of Iowa fans. But he brought it up early. Like, uh, I think it was his the, the was his opening there. statement. Yeah, it was. And he brought up the, the uh, struggles that was in 2021. I'm getting years mixed up 2021 or 2020 with Western Michigan, where he took play calling back because they were just a mess and they were struggling protecting the football. They were struggling to move the ball down the field. That is the balance that if you're an Iowa fan, what you want, you don't want Kirk to abandon the uh, emphasis that he places on protecting the football and on turnover margin. And they haven't been the best in turnover margin. The defense has produced good numbers although this last year they didn't have nearly as many takeaways as we're accustomed to seeing with phil's group but that's got to still be and that's been the formula for all this success so um i think that's here's, the positive thing here's one of the other interesting things what he looks for in quarterbacks he values efficiency at quarterback over mobility so mobility is kind of icing on the cake is what he kind of termed it but he wants guys that are efficient and I think when he's talking about efficient, he means don't turn it over, play smart, and and make good passes, make good throws. Yeah. You know, just manage a game, be efficient. And um, I think that's what he was getting at there. But, you know, he's not opposed to a mobile quarterback. He's just like he just doesn't want him to make a lot of mistakes. And that's probably a good thing. And uh, I know Kirk was asked about the uh, questions in the chat about wide receivers coach and Tom, uh, Don Patterson and I had a conversation with you about a week ago and you, uh, what you, the comment you made was that you have a feeling it's going to be Bud Meyer, but we've not gotten anything official. And uh, I believe you asked the question of yep. Kirk and um, he said, quote, we're on a good path. Yeah. So relates to that hire. Do you still feel like John Bud Meyer's the guy? I or think it's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why I framed it kind of in a different way where, you know, when he hired Greg Davis, who was an outsider to the Iowa program, um, he brought in one of his own guys. Bobby Kennedy is a wide receivers coach. And I was curious if that was something that maybe he would be open to. And it 
Kirk kind of danced on that question. <laughs> he went in about four different directions on that question without saying a whole lot and basically saying, um, it seems like he's got somebody that's in the pipeline, so to speak. Is that's how that's how I read it. Um, just like I've, I've, we've got things moving in in a certain direction. And I know a couple of notes that I had written down here uh, real quick, Mark. Um, Kirk did uh, go into specifics as it relates to confirming numbers that I think a lot of people like Tom had had already known about as it relates to serious candidates for the job. He mentioned a yeah. 10 to 12 person list, conversations with six, extensive conversations with four. Um, I would assume that those four, Tom, were Paul Christ, Kevin Johns, Tim Lester, and Joe Philbin would be my guess. Um, I don't know if he had the extensive ones. You know who it might have been? It might have been Chip Kelly. Yeah. That's, you that's, know. I don't know how extensive. Chip Kelly was. seems to be conversing with anyone who will listen to him about um, getting a, a getting out of UCLA. So, right. Um, yeah. Well, I'll tell you this. Here's one thing that really impresses me about Tim. He does not come across pompous, not from my perspective at all. Yeah. And I really really appreciated Don Patterson's perspective a week ago on the show when he talked about what Scott Schaefer had to say, because Scott Schaefer, I mean, I don't know that Scott's got any loyalty to talk up a big game about Tim Lester, but by all accounts, he is who he appears to be. And I don't, the one thing about, here's the silver lining for fans who are maybe a little bit hesitant or still skeptical. And I don't think there's anything wrong with being skeptical about the, the, the lack of power five experience. If you really read into that, I think the one silver lining there is, is it possible that there's maybe a, a degree of humility um, with a guy like Tim Lester, as opposed to getting a guy like Chip Kelly or a Cliff Kingsbury or a Kevin Johns, who's coached at a high power five level and maybe has a little bit of ego just naturally, right? Just human inclination. You know, maybe that ego is not there with Tim and maybe that's a good thing. I didn't sense any of ego no. with Coach Lester today. I thought it was interesting that Kirk brought up like kind of, celebrity coaches guys who were yep. i think that was the response to you correct yeah um, yeah it was. It, was, it was about guys who are wor more worried about certain things and their image and all kinds of different things than, than and being for the record, i thought it was a, i thought kirk answered that question wonderfully um and my question uh was simply you know we when i had a conversation i think we talked about this in the show last week as well um, I thought it was interesting, you know, Kirk has downplayed total offense for a long time, but in the university's press release about Tim Lester, they touted his total offensive numbers and rankings at Western Michigan. So my question was, you know, is that, are there goals as it relates to total offense criteria for evaluating moving forward? Does it remain the same? And I don't know if Kirk, I don't know his initial response to that question. I think maybe he felt like I was bringing up something in the past. I was not trying to do that. Obviously, Iowa's total offensive rankings have not been good. But as it relates to moving forward, how much of an emphasis does he place on that? And I appreciated the fact that he brought up what you just said, Tom, and talking about kind of these flashier coaches who are all about numbers, and I totally get that. But what I thought was good at the end is he brought up, if we can, and it was just refreshing to hear him say it, if we can run, if we can have 500-plus total yards of offense a game and hold them to 150, great, let's do it. But it's not priority number one, and I respect that answer. I thought it was a it was a really good answer. Oh, by the way, I, I don't know if you saw this. Um, um, this was on Buccaneers.com. Chad Lystico from the Register just tweeted it out. Iowa special teams coordinator Lavar Woods interviewing for the same spot with Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I, I did see that in the chat uh, a few minutes ago, and I wanted to ask you about that. So is this is that surprising? This is official. This is from Chad Lystico. You hadn't heard this prior. Well, this is, it is up on the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers website. Oh, okay. All right. It's Buccaneers.com. Um, and it makes you wonder if, well, is this a reaction potentially to Seth Wallace, who we spoke to today, being named the assistant head coach? You wonder. As in, like, yeah. questions about why LeVar wasn't given a heftier Maybe. rate? Maybe. You know, you wonder about that. Um, 
or is he trying to expand his horizons? Does he not want to be part of, um, I don't know. Is he, is he one of the growing number of coaches who is tired of where college football is headed? <laughs> you know, um, maybe. I think it's, it's <clears throat> interesting timing coming just a couple hours after a press conference where a lot of us would have been able to ask that question to Kirk. It, it says on Tuesday, the Buccaneers announced they've conducted a virtual interview with LeVar Woods, who is currently the special teams coordinator at the University of Iowa. Earlier in the day, they also confirmed interviews with Saints assistant special teams coordinator Phil Galliano and former Seahawks special teams coach Larry Izzo. Okay. So, yeah, I'm seeing that as well here, right from the Buccaneers website. So they uh, also have spoken to a couple of other guys. Maybe he is just. Kicking the tires a little bit, but uh, it is it is think, interesting. Yeah, I think I know. I know that um, last I think it was last year, or the year before, he got approached by Nick Saban to be Alabama special teams coordinator and turned that down. So, just interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, they don't want to lose him. I mean, I think from an Iowa standpoint. No. No, he's been uh, so it's been great. Too. He's been great, yep. and uh, and you don't want to lose somebody at this point. You know, you're, then you're going to have to go out and find somebody to be your new special teams coach uh, when you're bringing in a new punter. Um, you, you have a Drew St Drew Stevens back as the place kicker, but Drew, I think we'd all agree, struggled late in the year. Um. You know, it would be be interesting where Kirk would go with because he would have he couldn't he couldn't wait a whole lot uh, real long um, to find a special teams coordinator. Maybe he would hire from within. Um, you know, promote an Abdul Hodge or somebody like that into that position, and then hire a tight ends coach. I don't know. Well, um, I, there's not much behind. Drew Stevens. <laughs> no, but, well, they got the they got the um, the kid coming in, the freshman. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, who has the same who had the same uh, same kicking coach yeah. that Drew had. Yep. So they got Trip Woody coming in, but yeah, it, that's uh, that will be uh, with the new new punter and just everything uh, an interesting storyline to follow here. I don't know how long these searches typically take. Um, you mentioned a, a number of candidates that were mentioned on the Buccaneers website, but that will be a storyline to follow. Um, have we talked? Have you talked about Seth Wallace yet, Tom? Uh, really haven't. Really haven't. I, I uh, so Seth talked uh, just well. I guess second to Kirk, Mark, uh, towards the beginning of the press conference, and uh, just kind of an intro to his new position. I, I don't get the feeling like there's a whole ton of, of job duty changes. Right. Um, I think one thing, Tom, you said last week on our show was, you know, maybe in a situation where you're in a bond and you need someone to, to fill in as acting head coach. Now you have a natural candidate for that. But uh, same thing with Seth Wallace. I'd apply Tim Lester. Uh, like I really do detect a level of humility um, from him. And I know he went through some stuff back in 2020, along with all the off field yeah. accusations. And, um, you know, I don't know, we, we only know one side of that, but I get the feeling that maybe he's, he's learned from his experiences. And as a result, he is not a guy who wants to rush into anything. He doesn't seem to be in a rush to jump to a defensive coordinator job or be a head coach. His focus, at least what he says, his focus is on the now. Um, now I'm sure he's thinking of, I mean, sure. He's thought about head coaching opportunities down mm -hmm. the line, but he learned from his dad. He grew up in what Brooklyn, Iowa. Um, he's a small town Iowa kid. Grinnell. Grinnell. In, in Grinnell, yeah. So um, interesting story for a, an Iowa guy who has climbed the ladder. Yeah, he is, um, you know, it's kind of a classic story. A guy who starts as a, you know, a GA, small college player, played at Co. Um, you know, then does his GA, then goes to Valdosta State moves up there, up the ranks, and eventually is their D.C., and then comes back to Iowa and is back down at the lower level of the totem pole. I remember when he came back, uh, Eric Johnson had left as the recruiting coordinator, and that was kind of 
Seth's role at that point in time was recruiting coordinator. And I talked to Seth quite a bit, um, you know, just, just about what might be going on and got, you know, he was, he was always very helpful. Um, I, even then I could tell this guy's different, you know, he's the arrows pointing up with this guy. So he did a terrific job and he's worked his way up and, uh, now he he was the you know assistant DC the last couple of years, and you know sometimes you create titles to to bring in more revenue for a guy, and there's some of that because you want to retain talent. You've got to figure out a way to much like you're doing now with NIL with players and trying to retain talent that'll go out and play on Saturdays. You want to retain talent that is in your building every day, teaching those players and. Seth has had a number of opportunities. Had one with a Big Ten school last year that I know of. Had one with another Big Ten school this year that I know of. Um, so he's had he's had these really interesting opportunities, and um, he's turned them all down. And the big reason is the the head football coach. Um, and, and there's an appreciation to him for the opportunities that he's been given. And that tells you a lot about what makes him tick, but he's also making a million dollars a year now, which is, you know, <laughs> that, that makes things like life, life a lot easier. Right, Mark? I'm Mark, all for that. Know? Yes. I, I think that. <laughs> Mark, you know all about making the million a year. So yes, absolutely. So but yeah, so I can relate. Here. One thing that he said, and I know you could say, call it, just toss it aside as lip service, but he made the comment multiple times that he wants to be here. Well, it is easy to, to want to be somewhere that's paying you a million dollars a year, but you do get the sense, not just from him, but I've talked about it on, yes. on my show before. His players really do have an admiration for him. They and I don't think that's, that is not a, uh, the, I won't even mention the person's name, but the person in the comment that is bringing up uh, how he bullied Jack Kallenberger, forced him off the team. He is a bad person. Just remember the person who's saying that in the chat, whose name will remain unnamed for now. I've seen some of the crap that you've put in the chat, bullying other people in the chat. So before you uh, call out other people, let's just check yourself for a second. And just because of, even if he was guilty as charged with what happened with the whole Jack Kallenberger situation, like I, I'm so done with the cancel culture in the world where you just, someone makes a mistake and you, they just never can have a life or never build a reputation back again. What a joke. So based on everything I've heard from Seth Wallace, I know you're closer to him than I am, Tom. Um, I have no reason to believe that if that did happen, he's learned from that and he has every right to be able to continue and, his and, career. As and, and I'll, I'll say this too. I, I know the Kallenbergers. Okay. I know Mark and Jack and their family and I know um, Seth, and nobody felt worse about it than Seth did. He apologized to him. Everything is good with them. Yeah. It's all good between him and the Kallenberger family. That's I great. Mean, I think Mark is working. He was for a while. I don't know if he still is, but he was working at a pizza place in, in um, Iowa City area. And Seth would go there and get pizzas. And, and there's no problems. Yeah. Everything is good. So, um, yeah, he, you know, he, who among us hasn't said something that's stupid? Well, Tom, you know, if, 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 uh, think about if each one of us had the worst moments in our lives highlighted on the national scale, well, we, we'd all be done. We, yeah. we, we'd be done. So I just get so tired of that, that mindset. But anyways, I brought it up just simply because I love a, a, a good, comeback story if you will not that he I mean, he had a great reputation as a coach prior to that he's a great recruiter he's a great but, recruiter but man he, he is uh, i've just heard nothing but rave reviews from any player since that time period since 2020 anybody that's come to that program has just raved about him and we've seen the results on the field people who have wanted to come back like jay higgins like nick jackson um go down the list jack campbell um and Kyler Fisher is another example. That's another thing that we didn't bring up, Tom, the fact that his room now has their top three linebackers back. Yeah. Any one of them could have moved on. And how about the uniqueness of this? And he didn't give himself credit for this. It was kind of just a, an intricacy of the recruiting cycle. 
the fact that this past site, this past class, 2024, they get three really talented linebackers from the state of Iowa. That's a unique thing that doesn't happen every year. With within 50 miles of Iowa City, all of them, as you've noted, with uh, um, one from Williamsburg, one from uh, um, Winfield Mount Union, and the other one from Monticello. I mean, uh, that's pretty good. And all of them are really good. Yes, They're they all are. really good, uh, all really talented. And, um, you know, he's already got a talented room and talked about now how do you negotiate with some of those guys that have been really patiently waiting and like a Carson Shire or a Jaden Harrell or somebody like that, that now they're going to still be behind. Um, it's going to be interesting. So what do um, you do? Do you, I mean, I don't want to throw out names, but I've asked this question before, like how many guys can they head into fall with at that position? Good question. I would just expect some attrition there. Um, they're at 92 total. Yeah. Um, so that's a spot. Maybe they could, could drop somebody, but we'll see. Here are a few things that, that struck me about uh, today's news conference and also some comments that you guys made. So you brought up the, the, the word opportunity. And this is obviously an opportunity. Anytime someone takes a new job, it's an opportunity. But beyond that, uh, Tim Lester's a smart guy. And maybe he sees the opportunity here as being different than most places in college football that he can fill a role at a top level football program, but that is so void in this area that this is just a huge career opportunity for him to go in and show what he can do. He had some really good offenses at Western Michigan during a period of time. And the last year was, was not good. Um, and that was brought up today, but he had some really good offenses there. Now translating it over to the power five level, that will be a challenge. Um, but like, I, I, I am starting to buy into the fact that I think, or the notion that I think this is going to end up being a steal of a hire for Iowa. I don't believe, and you know, we've got a lot of time before the season starts. I don't believe if this offense continues to fail miserably, I then think you have to look beyond who the OC is. Yes. A lot of fans have done that a long time ago, but I don't think you can attribute this. Well, it's just another bad hire. Again, I'm doing more research and, and hearing more about his background and uh, his accomplishments, endorsements from other respected people in the college football coaching sphere makes me think this guy is absolutely qualified for this job. And again, um, my biggest thing is exactly what Tom brought up. He's going to be upstairs. He's going to be able to see the field. That's the way it should have been in the first place, in my opinion. He is a former quarterback. He is going to be working with the quarterbacks and actually working with them as opposed to what we had with Brian, who was a quarterback's coach, and really John Budmeyer was filling that role. That's called dysfunction, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, I think the, the whole thing is he brought up adjustments, um, making adjustments, how important that is during games. How many times this past year, the year before, did we at halftime say, man, they're going to have to do something different at halftime? I wonder what adjustments they've got up their sleeve. And it seemed like every time they came out in the second half, it was the exact same thing. There were never adjustments that we could see. And like, I don't, I'm sure Brian tried, but I like, again, you're limited. I mean, Tim even said that today. He believes that you're limited when you're not able to see the whole field and see what's going on everywhere. It's very hard to make ga in game adjustments. Um, so I think that was dysfunctional and didn't help Brian's case. There were a lot of things that I think Brian could have done and Kirk could have done that would not have been all that difficult to change that could have helped his chances at succeeding. One being, I think he should have been up in the press box. Another being, I think they should have brought someone else in who could have coached the passing game, wouldn't have had to take the title on, but could have coached the passing game and allowed Brian to coach running backs. There's a lot of things you've done the list, but that ship has sailed. Um, my question to Kirk today, and again, I only got one question in. I wanted to ask him a question, just didn't get around to it. But my one question that I got to ask Kirk, and for the record, Kirk was, at, was uh, made available first for questions. And that's the only reason that I asked this question first, because I wanted to know about Tom or about Tim. But the question that I asked was, you know, in the past, Kirk has been quoted as saying, 
that he believes total offense is the most overrated stat in football. Again, in the press release that uh, announced the hiring of Tim Lester, those numbers were touted. Now, let me ask you this, uh, Mark. Is it a fair question to to ask about kind of assimilating that and, and, and getting to the bottom of, okay, what's actually important here? Do you still agree with what you said a year or two ago about total offense not being important? Or how are we going to evaluate moving forward as it relates to the new OC? That was my question. And it's also not like you picked on one specific statement that Kirk made two years ago about the offense and evaluating the offense. This has been a consistent theme for years that he has gone to a number of times to say wins and losses are all that matter. We play complimentary football. That's how we evaluate the offensive coordinator based on wins and losses. And then here we are. Uh, with a new offensive coordinator. So absolutely fair. And again, I, I happen to believe that, um, uh, yes, Don in the chat, Brian did start in the press box. Again, he had that meltdown in 20, 20, uh, 2017 and then ended up moving down to the field. So I think part of that was what happened in 2017. Anyways, um, what were we talking about? Oh, total offense. So I, I believe that that, press release and the announcement and focusing in on Tim Lester's total offensive numbers is absolutely legitimate and is absolutely something we should be looking at. Those are great indicators for offensive productivity, not everything that needs to be known, but if, if the press release had read, you know, he had was responsible for this many wins at Western Michigan, this many wins at, at Syracuse, you know, and he was the head coach at Western Michigan in his defense, but we're talking about him being the OC at Iowa, not the head coach. Right. So, that's where, you know, I, I just wanted to kind of get a, a feel for where Kirk stood on it. And again, I thought Kirk answered the question very well. Uh, he does. I think it's clear to to say that he does not place as great of importance on total offense as some do. But he explained why. And he explained why. And, and I thought he explained well. Um, and the bottom line is priority wise. Priority is for, for Kirk. It is protecting the football, ball control, time of possession. Um and doing whatever we need to do to get a win. Absolutely. And I agree with that. I, I, for the record, I've never disagreed with that. But, um, you know, oftentimes you can, there's no question, you can, there is a correlation between being the 130th ranked total offense and your offense not being good. That's <laughs> a bit of a cause. I think it's a correlation and probably you could argue cause-effect relationship there, direct yes. correlation. Yes, there, there is definitely a correlation between being the worst ranked offense in the country and losing to your three toughest opponents, scoring zero points in those three games. Now, we both know that had the offense thrived under Brian's direction and the defense would have faltered in the special teams and Iowa would have been churning out six and six and seven and five teams the last few years with tremendous offense and horrendous defense then Kirk would be stating, well, the offensive production is what is the responsibility of the offensive coordinator. And the offensive coordinator was producing all these points in yardage, but we didn't uh, supplement it on these other areas. You can about guarantee that. Uh, but getting back to Tim Lester, if I may, this is what I was impressed with is, and, and you were there in person to get the full effect. I'm just watching on video. He's a communicator. He's a very confident and comfortable communicator. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe that's one of the reasons he got a head coaching job, or maybe that's something that he learned as a head coach, probably a little bit of both. And also I was very impressed with him being, uh, as, uh, transparent and explaining as much as he did. Um, also giving respect to, he understands the situation. He understands how bad the offense has been. He knows what the situation was uh, with Kirk and Brian and the whole dynamic of the situation. And you touched upon a statement that he made early in his introductory comments. And I'll add one term to it. He said, we're going to be physical we're going to be disciplined. We're going to be aggressive. He knows that Iowa football is all about being physical and being disciplined, not making mistakes, being physical, being the tougher team, being the team that 
that is the team that controls the line of scrimmage. So he knows that that's Iowa's brand and he needs to support that and confirm that. And most football coaches would back that up, whether they're at Iowa or somewhere else. Uh, it's still a physical sport. But then to add to that, the aggressive component, I was kind of curious as to, okay, what does he mean by being aggressive? Uh, to me, as the play caller, that means being aggressive when it makes sense. Uh, he also talked about the running game, and you don't hear this term attached to the running game very often when he said, we want to be an explosive running game. Said that a few times about explosiveness in the running game. And uh, quite a bit of misdirection if you watch some of that tape at uh, Western Michigan, a lot of misdirection with the run game. And I'm going to go back and listen to the press conference again because you're your person. You're, I'm, you know, I was took about a page of notes here, but um, I'm sure I missed some. I can see why, just from a human perspective, why he impressed Kirk so much in the interview process. I mean, can't you, yeah. Mark? Like, oh yeah, he's, he's very seasoned, and I think that's the thing. Like, no, he doesn't have a ton of Power Five OC experience, and Syracuse was a long time ago. You know, how successful was he? You know, there, Kirk kind of downplayed the Syracuse experiment, by the way, or experience. He kind of downplayed that whole thing because it was a long time ago. But I do think the fact that he was, a, I just think the plethora of experience, he's done it at the Power Five level at, at Syracuse, an ACC school. He's done it at um, Western Michigan as a head coach and play caller. He's done it in an FBS school. And then he's he's uh, coached in the NFL for a year, at kind of a unique position on a Matt Lafleur staff with the Green Bay Packers. I just think he brings a lot of seasoned experience that Iowa did not have at that position the last time they hired an offensive coordinator. Like when Brian Ferentz, I, I wasn't covering Iowa the way I I try to cover it now, um, but the last time they they uh, appointed a, a coordinator or promoted a coordinator, it was Brian Ferentz. I, I kind of remember that press conference, but like, like what were you going to ask Brian about? His experience at New England. Like, that's basically what you were going to ask him about. He was a tight ends coach at New England, and he coached positions, a couple of positions at Iowa before being promoted. But like, in general, that's what he did. You asked Tim Lester about his experience. Well, he coached the Shanahan offense at Elmhurst. Uh, it was part of that Shanahan offense, I should say, at Elmhurst. Um, he was again the play caller at Western Michigan, OC at Syracuse. Then he was, you know, worked with the Matt LaFleur offense um, as an analyst and kind of looking at it from a different perspective. He's done RPO, he's done all these different things. And he's a former quarterback. He played the position that Iowa needs maybe the most help at. I just think all those things should really be encouraging to fans. Um, and again, it doesn't mean you can't remain skeptical because there's also reasons to remain skeptical about Kirk's ability to evaluate OCs because he hasn't done a great job of hiring OCs. Not in my opinion. Ken O'Keefe was an okay hire at the time and had good years. Greg Davis didn't really work out and certainly Brian Ferentz didn't work out. So, you know, I'm fine with saying I have to see it to believe it, but I, I, I am encouraged by everything that I've heard, seen, listened to over the past week. One of the last comments you made to Tom and asked, uh, about whether Kirk's going to be open to listening to, to Tim's opinions about different personnel and direction and so forth. Uh, I hope that Kirk did make a hire of somebody that, that he respects to the point where he's going to listen to them and possibly change his thinking about certain things rather than this is a plug and play guy and he's going to direct my offense and he's going to call the plays and I trust him with that but I don't want to hear anything about doing anything different or any kind of different direction. Uh, just run the offense and we'll be fine. I don't think that's going to happen. I just don't think that's going to happen. I really do believe that having it, not to say that they're going to turn into a top 50 offense, but I'm just saying like, I do think uh, I'll triple quadruple down on what I've said so many times before. I think their biggest problem was at the offensive coordinator position. Now, Kirk probably doesn't believe that. In fact, Kirk was quoted. I wrote down a uh, quote from Kirk today, and he this was before any questions were asked. Kirk said, I think it's pretty obvious the reasons why we struggled last year offensively. But then he didn't go into the reasons. Um, and look, I, I, I think Kirk already was maybe a little bit touchy with the question that I asked him. Um, 
I wasn't going to ask, why did you struggle last year, Kirk? I mean, it's an introductory press conference for Tim Lester. So that's why I wanted to focus on how you're going to be evaluating that position, that coach moving forward. But I do think Kirk really does believe in his heart of hearts that had they just stayed healthy, they would have been a lot better. And I, I think, I don't want to call it delusion, but I do think there's a degree of, of having a big blinder on because it is, it is Brian. And hopefully, here's where we're at. Hopefully, like the the Beth Getz decision or Barbara Wilson, we want to attribute that decision to let Brian go. Regardless of that decision, Brian Ferentz was fired as the offensive coordinator. He was not fired as Kirk's son. So Kirk does not have to agree with the decision, and Kirk does not have to believe that Brian was responsible for the putrid offense. But if that was the case, if it was just due to injuries, then they weren't deep enough. And if injuries happen this next year and the year after that with Tim Lester, they're going to be just as crappy. And I don't believe that's going to be the case. I, I just, I have more uh, trust in his experience and his resume uh, than now. I wasn't like 1999. I was not, uh, <laughs> the world was a lot different in 99. So we, there were no shows like this talking about Ken O'Keefe being hired. Um, and the Greg Davis hire was such a, a weird situation where again, I think it was pretty much, a, it's obvious it was a stepping stone to, to Brian. But um, I have a lot more faith in this hire than, than I would have expected a week and a half ago.